Hi everyone, my name is Ethan Plotzker. I work with the Match Guy, and today we're going to be going over some of the highest yield facts in microbiology for the step exams. First, we're going to dive right into it and cover our gram positive organisms. So, we're going to start with our streptococci. So, first we have strep pyogenes. That's going to cause your typical pharyngitis, scarlet fever, and impetigo with that honey crusted rash. Next, we have strep pneumo, which is going to cause that mnemonic of symptoms called MOPS, which is meningitis, otitis media, pneumonia, and sinusitis. Next, we have Streptococcus aegalactiae, which is known for causing neonatal meningitis. Next, we have Strep bovis, which causes endocarditis in the context of patients who have colon cancer. And finally, we have Strep viridens, which causes endocarditis in the context of patients who often just had a dental procedure. Next, we're going to go into our Staphylococci. So here we have Staphylococcus epidermidis which in patients who have foreign bodies or catheters can cause a lot of biofilms and really hard to get rid of infections because of those biofilms, which stop medications a lot of times from penetrating through. Next, we have Staph aureus, which is going to cause abscesses, toxic shock syndrome, um, staphylococcal scalded syndrome, and osteomyelitis. And finally, we have Staphylococcus saprophyticus, which is known for causing UTIs. Next up are the bacilli. Our first one is Bacillus cereus, which is known for causing infections in people who have eaten a lot of times reheated rice, and they love to ask that fact. Next is Bacillus anthracis, which causes both cutaneous and pulmonary anthrax. I would know the manifestations of those for the exam and how they differ. Next, we have Clostridium tetani, which will be text tested in the context of um, tetanus. So that's spastic paralysis and lockjaw. Next, we have Clostridium botulinum, which is known for causing floppy baby syndrome. And they love to test these five Ds, which are diplopia, dysarthria, dysphagia, dyspnea, and descending flaccid paralysis. That's in contrast, and they can try to trick you by putting something like Guillain-Barre, but remember, that's ascending. Next, we have Clostridium perfringens, which causes gas gangrene and food poisoning. And next, we have Clostridium difficile also called C. diff, which causes diarrhea after either hospitalizations or antibiotics. Our next group of bacilli starts off with Carinibacterium diphtheriae, which causes diphtheria. They can often test this in the context of a gray pseudomembrane behind the mouth, in addition to fever and swollen glands. Next, we have Listeria monocytogenes, which is known for causing meningitis in neonates and the immunocompromised and also um, infecting pregnant women. Next, we have nocardia and actinomyces, which cause pulmonary infections in immunocompromised patients. One of the special things about actinomyces is that these bacteria often cause oral abscesses identified on exam by these yellow sulfur granules. One of the important things to know about nocardia and actinomyces as well is that they're both branching, which is why they have the asterisks next to them. Finally, we have our mycobacteria, like TB, mycobacterium avium complex, and mycobacterium leprae. All of these are acid fast. And one of the most important things to know is, of these is probably TB. So for TB, they usually will test it in the context of someone who is in a scenario that is often affected by TB, like a nursing home or person in a jail or someone in a country that may have um, not good sanitation and usually they'll present with fever weight loss and night sweats next for our enterococci we start off with enterococcus faecalis and enterococcus facium so both grow in 40 percent bile or 6.5 percent sodium chloride and cause uti or biliary tract infections or also endocarditis following GI and GU procedures. Well, that's pretty much it for the gram positives. And up next, we have our gram negative organisms. Our first gram negative organisms of interest are the Neisseria species. So the first one is Neisseria meningitidis. That's gonna typically cause meningitis and the patients will present in the question with fever and neck rigidity, and they will be very, very acutely ill. Next, we have Neisseria gonorrhea, which causes symptoms like urethritis, cervicitis, 
pelvic inflammatory disorder, and it can often be identified on exam by a creamy purulent discharge from whatever the infected site is. Up next, we have the gram-negative bacilli. So this starts with E. coli. E. coli is known for causing food poisoning, and it can cause something called hemolytic uremic syndrome if it is the certain serotype of E. coli called EHEC. That's um, very high yield for the exam. One of the next bacteria is Salmonella enteritidis, which causes a typically self-limiting gastroenteritis. One of the next ones is Salmonella typhi, which causes typhoid fever. One of the ways that this will be tested on the exam is with the typical rose spots on the abdomen, and they like to ask where this organism lives in the body, where its reservoir is, and that's in the gallbladder. Next, we have serratia, which is known for causing a red pigment when it starts to grow and form a biofilm, and it's often nosocomial. Next, we have Shigella dysenteriae, which causes bloody stools, usually from the enterotoxin, which is called shigatoxin. Next, we have Klebsiella pneumoniae, which causes a current jelly sputum, which is very high yield. A lot of times it can cause a lot of different pneumonias and respiratory infections. Finally, we have Proteus, which is urease producing and associated with struvite stones. I would make sure you know how to identify those struvite stones under microscopy because that's a great way for them to combine both a renal and a microbiology question into one. Next in our bacilli, we have H. pylori or Helicobacter pylori. So this is going to be GI ulcers treated with triple therapy. So that's going to be macrolides, PPIs, and amoxicillin. Next up, we have Vibrio cholera, which in patients who are in developing countries, they'll typically get it from contaminated water and have pretty bad diarrhea from it. Next, we have Vibrio vulnificus, which causes gastroenteritis from seafood, often in iron deficient patients. It's a very high yield point in iron deficient patients. Next, we have Pseudomonas species, which typically causes a grape-like odor and infections in patients who have diabetes and or burns. It's also notably a cause of chronic pneumonia in adults with cystic fibrosis. And a lot of times they'll ask, a patient just comes into the ED, they have a history of CF, what organism is likely causing this patient's pneumonia? And they'll have you pick between Staph aureus and Pseudomonas. Staph aureus causes the infections in CF patients who are kids. In CF patients who are adults, it's going to be Pseudomonas. One of the other notable things about Pseudomonas is that it can cause a keratitis, often patients who have contact lenses, hence the picture on the right. And finally, we have bacterioides species, which live in the gut, and they're typically anaerobes and can cause any kind of infections in that area. Next in our bacilli, we have Haemophilus ducrii, which causes painful genital chankers. They like to ask in the context of patients who have genital ulcers and make you pick an organism based on whether the ulcer is painful or not, based on the history of the patient, all those different things. So I would make sure you know about all the different types of genital ulcers and knowing how to distinguish them because that's going to get you some points on the exam. Next, we have Legionella pneumophila, which causes Legionnaire's disease, pneumonia, and GI issues, often from air conditioners, as you can see on the right. Next, we have Haemophilus influenza, which is an encapsulated bacteria and typically causes epiglottitis. They, a lot of times, will show a picture of an x-ray with the thumbprint sign. Finally, we have Bordetella pertussis, which causes whooping cough, and it does that with a virulence factor of pertussis toxin. There's three stages to the Bordetella pertussis disease. The first one is catarrhal, which is fevers. Then we come to paroxysmal, which is cough. And then we come to convalescent, which is a gradual recovery. Next up are our zoonotics, which are essentially all gram-negative too. So our first one is Francisella tularensis. The main reservoir to know for that one is rabbits. Next, we have Pastorella multocida, which causes cellulitis and osteomyelitis, typically from animal bites. Next, we have Bartonella hensley, which causes cat scratch disease. And a lot of times you can see that patients have a lot of severe lymphadenopathy in that area. Next, we have Brucella, which causes brucellosis, which is marked by undulant fevers. Then we come to Yersinia pestis, which causes the plague and its reservoirs are fleas. Finally, we have Yersinia enterolytica, which a lot of times is tested to make students pick between that disease and appendicitis. 
A lot of times it can cause right lower quadrant pain, like appendicitis. This condition, however, will often cause an acute bloody diarrhea. And then for our miscellaneous bacteria, microbacteria are a bit weird because they are acid fast. So I just wanted to throw these in here. And then next we have our spirochetes, so Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease. We have Leptospira interrogans, which a lot of times infects patients from animal urine contaminated water, and it can affect the spleen often in liver. And next we have Treponema pallidum, which causes syphilis. I would know how they're going to test primary, secondary, and tertiary syphilis on the exam. Then finally, we have Chlamydia trachomatis, which is an obligate intracellular organism, and it has many different stereotypes, but the main thing to know is that it can cause everything from reactive arthritis to atypical pneumonia to pelvic inflammatory disorder. Next, we have rickettsia, which causes typhus and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. I would know that for Rocky Mountain spotted fever, it's one of the few conditions where you have a rash that starts on the extremities and progresses inward. Then finally, we have mycoplasma pneumoniae, which causes an atypical pneumonia and erythema multiform. All right, so we made it through our bacteria. Now let's get started on our DNA viruses. So we're going to start off with herpes simplex types 1 and 2. These are going to cause cold sores, herpetic whitlow, temporal lobe encephalitis in the context of HSV1 and herpes genitalis in the context of HSV2. Next, we have varicella zoster, which causes chickenpox and shingles. Next, we have Epstein-Barr, which causes mononucleosis, and it infects B cells through the CD21 receptor. That's very high yield. Then we have cytomegalovirus, also called CMV, which also causes mononucleosis, but a high yield point here is that unlike Epstein-Barr, it will cause a negative monospot test. Then we have HHV6, which causes roseola. That's a rash that starts on the trunk and goes to the extremities. And then we have HHV8, which is Kaposi sarcoma. That's going to cause a lot of dark violaceous nodules in patients who are immunocompromised. Finally, we have hepatitis B, which is from blood and sex. Usually that's how it's transmitted. And it initially presents like serum sickness. So fevers, rashes, arthralgias, that sort of presentation. Next, we have pox virus, also called smallpox. It's been eradicated due to our vaccine, but they do like students to know that that vaccine was live attenuated. Another kind of pox virus is molluscum contagiosum, which is known for causing flesh-colored papules with an indent in the middle. That can be seen on the right. Then we have adenovirus, which causes conjunctivitis and acute hemorrhagic cystitis, so blood in the urine. Then we have human papillomavirus, or HPV. So for this, I would know which serotypes are associated with which cancers and which are with warts. For JC virus, we have progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, usually in HIV patients. And then for patients who have parvovirus B19, that's going to cause your presentation of a slapped cheek rash, a plastic crisis in sickle cell, um, pure red blood cell aplasia, and rheumatoid arthritis-like symptoms in adults, often those who work in daycares or preschools. Next, we have our RNA viruses. So starting off strong with hepatitis A, you get this from seafood, and it causes an acute and self-resolving disease in adults. Somehow, though, it's often asymptomatic in kids. Next, we have polio virus. For this, I would know how it presents and also about the two vaccines. So there's the Sabin vaccine, which is live attenuated, and the Salk vaccine, which is killed. Next, we have Echovirus, which causes aseptic meningitis, and then the Coxsackie virus, which causes hand, foot, and mouth disease. Finally, we have Rhinovirus, which causes the common cold. For our retroviruses, we're starting off with HIV, or human immunodeficiency virus. So for this, I would know about the virus structure and the structural genes that go into it, and all the common diseases that manifest in HIV based on CD4 count. There's a great chart in first aid that I would know at the back of your hand. Then up next, we have human T-cell leukemia virus. That's known for causing lytic bone lesions and hypercalcemia. So if you see that, you probably should think HTLV. Next, we have the flaviviruses, 
So the first one is Dengue. The vector for that is the Aedes mosquito, and it can cause either Dengue fever or Dengue hemorrhagic fever, which is like Dengue fever, but it adds thrombocytopenia and significant bleeding onto it. Then we also have yellow fever virus, which isn't tested too often, but just good to know about. Then we have hepatitis C virus, which is often transmitted through blood or infected needles. And of note, it can progress to liver cirrhosis or cancer because hepatitis C has a very common carrier state. Finally, we have West Nile virus, which causes meningoencephalitis and flaccid paralysis in patients who were also bit by a mosquito. Then we have Khaleesi viruses, like the Norwalk virus, which causes um, diarrhea and a GI illness, a lot of times in the context of either cruise ships or preschools. Then we have hepatitis E virus, which is known for causing a very fulminant hepatitis in pregnant patients. Coronavirus, I think, needs little explanation, but it can cause a SARS-like um, disease, and it's been the subject of the most recent pandemic that we've had. Bunya viruses include things like hantavirus and California encephalitis virus. So both of these are going to cause a hemorrhagic fever or pneumonia. And I would know for this that the main risk factor, like shown in the picture, is contact with mouse droppings or rodents. For the orthomyxoviruses, the main one to know is influenza. I would know that it's an enveloped virus and that it's segmented. I would know about genetic shift versus drift. They like to have students pick those out and know about all the surface proteins that go into it. For the paramyxoviruses, um, starting off with rubiola and measles, that's going to cause your four C's, which is cough, conjunctivitis, coryza, and complex spots. Those complex spots are little spots on the back of the palate. Then we have mumps, which causes parotitis, orchitis, and aseptic meningitis. RSV is known for causing a respiratory infection in kids through its F protein, which causes fusion of respiratory epithelial cells. Next up, we have RSV, which is going to cause a respiratory infection in kids, and that's going to be through its F protein, which causes fusion of respiratory epithelial cells. A lot of times they ask how you treat or prevent this. The answer is palivizumab. It's a monoclonal antibody. Then finally, we have parainfluenza, which causes croup, which is marked by a barking cough and inspiratory strider. Then we have rabies virus, which uses the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor to travel. And it travels up to the brain where it causes negri bodies. And that can be seen on histology. And it's usually from bat bites. They like to test if students know the most common place that people get it from. It's not dogs, it's actually bats. Next are our arena viruses. So we have um, Lassa fever virus to start. The main reservoir for that is rodents. And then we have lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus, or LCMV. That's going to cause a meningoencephalitis also from rodents. Then for our phyloviruses, we have Ebola virus and Marburg virus. Both of these are known to cause a hemorrhagic fever, and they are usually fatal. And then we come to our rheoviruses, which are all double-stranded DNA viruses. And that's a very high yield because it separates them from all the other single-strand viruses that are either DNA or RNA. So rheovirus and rotovirus both cause a diarrheal illness in preschools and cruise ships. And then we have Colorado tick fever virus as well, but that's not as high yield as the rio and rotavirus. Next, we start with our fungi, which are becoming increasingly high yield on the exam because they know that everyone's going to study the bacteria and viruses, but they still do put a lot of questions on fungi and later parasites, which we'll get to. So starting off with Histoplasma capsulatum, I would know that this is in the Ohio River Valley, and usually it's caused by bat droppings, and the ways it manifests is hepatosplenomegaly and pancytopenia. For Coxioides imidis, I would definitely know what happens in the southwest United States, as you can see in this map. And the ways you can see it on histology are spherules of endospores. It also causes erythema nodosum, arthralgias, and it can disseminate to both the bone and skin. Next, we have blastomycosis dermatitidis, which usually affects patients in the central U.S. or Great Lakes region. 
Um, when you look at it, you could see that it has broad-based budding, and it causes lung disease and verrucous skin lesions. Then finally, we have Paracoxioides brasiliensis, which usually affects patients in Latin America, not so much the United States, but it looks like a captain's wheel when you look at it. Next, for our cutaneous fungal infections, we have the triad of trichophyton, microsporum, and epidermophyton. So all three of these things are marked by branching septae, which are visible on KOH prep, and they can cause things like ringworm, jock itch, and athlete's foot. Then we have Malassezia furfur, which you can see in the screen to the right. That's going to cause a lot of hypopigmentation spots, and on microscopy you can see a spaghetti and meatballs kind of appearance to it. The treatment for that is selenium sulfide. And then we have Sporothrix schenkii, which is known to cause infections from rose thorns, and it typically ascends along the lymphatics. So you'll see red streaks often up the arms or legs or wherever the person was stuck by the thorn. Up next, we have Candida albicans, which causes thrush and immunocompromise. You can a lot of times see like a white film in the patient's mouth. It can also cause diaper rash and endocarditis in patients who are IV drug users. And the treatment for that is nystatin, azoles, or if it's systemic, amphotericin B. Next, we have Cryptococcus neoformans, which is narrow budding, and it is often from pigeon droppings. You can see it on microscopy with India ink and mucicarmine. They like to test both of those. And in the brain, when you look at imaging, you can see soap bubble lesions. Then we have mucor and rhizopus, which cause a necrotic eschar on the face in patients who have diabetes. Aspergillus is um, an acute angle branching yeast, and it causes either invasive aspergillosis or allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. And then finally, we have pneumocystis gerevechii, which causes a diffuse interstitial pneumonia with ground glass opacities on chest x-ray. And I would know for this one that you prophylax against it in patients who have HIV and a CD4 count under 200. Up next, we have our helminths and our parasites. So our tapeworms are first. These are Tania solium and saginata. So solium comes from undercooked pork and saginata comes from the undercooked beef. And I would know how both these look on microscopy. The solium has those teeth in the circle around it, kind of on the face. Saginata does not. Then we have Diphilobothrium latum, which is a tapeworm that comes from undercooked fish. And then we have Echinococcus granulosis. That causes hydatid cysts in the liver, and cyst rupture can cause anaphylaxis. So a lot of times they ask what you do to prevent anaphylaxis, and you would inject the cyst with alcohol. For our flukes, our first one is schistosoma. For this, I would know the types. So Mansoni, Japonicum, and Hematobium. And how they all look based on their spines. I would note snails are the intermediate host, as you can see in this diagram to the right. And they penetrate skin and contaminated water. Next, we have Clonorchus sinensis, which causes biliary tract inflammation and pigmented gallstones. And then we have Paragonimus westermani, which is a lung fluke. Our roundworms, so these include Enterobius vermicularis, which is also called pinworm. That causes anal pruritus, and you can see eggs on the scotch tape test. That's actually what's in the picture to the right over here. Then we have Oscaris lumbricoides, which causes obstruction at the ileocecal valve because this worm can get pretty large. They can also travel to the alveoli and cause something called Lafleur syndrome, which is a pulmonary eosinophilia. Then we have Toxocara canis, which is transmitted from a fecal oral root. It causes visceral larva migraines, and it can affect multiple organs. Then we have Strongyloides stercorilis. That causes GI, pulmonary, and cutaneous symptoms, and it can also cause auto-infection, which is unique to that disease. Another unique thing is that it's treated with ivermectin. Then we have Necator americanus, which is hookworm. That causes cutaneous larva migraines, and you can see a serpinguinous rash under the skin sometimes, and it comes from walking on contaminated soil. Then we have Trichinella spiralis, which comes from undercooked pork, 
and it causes myositis and periorbital edema. It's often sometimes from eating bear meat. Wichuria bancrofti causes a lymphatic filiaresis and lymphedema. With loa loa, you can see a worm in the conjunctiva. And then for Oncocerca volvulus, you'll see black skin nodules and blindness. And that comes from the black fly. So that's an easy one to remember because everything for that is black. Next, we have our protozoa. So for CNS infections, we start off with Toxoplasma gondii. That causes the triad of chorioretinitis, hydrocephalus, and intracranial calcifications, usually from cat feces or undercooked meat. Then we have Nyglaria phalari, which causes meningoencephalitis from swimming in infected water. And then we have Acanthamoeba species, which causes granulomatous amoebic encephalitis. Next, we have Giardia lambula. So this is going to cause foul smelling, fatty diarrhea, floating stools, bloating, and it's often from cysts in infected water. Then we have Enthamoeba histolytica, which causes dysentery, which is marked by bloody diarrhea. It can also cause pain in the right upper quadrant due to liver abscesses. And then we have Cryptosporidium species, which causes watery diarrhea, usually in patients who have HIV and AIDS. For our visceral and hematologic infections, we start off with Trypanosoma cruzii, which causes Chagas disease. That is going to dilate essentially everything. So dilated cardiomyopathy, megacolon, and megaesophagus. And we have Leishmania donovani, which has two types. There's a visceral type, which causes spiking fevers and hepatitis donomegaly, and a cutaneous type, which causes skin ulcers. On microscopy, you can see macrophages, which contain amastigotes. Then we have our plasmodium species, which cause malaria. For this, I would know the three types, which are vivax, oval, and falciparum. I would know the lifestyle, which you can see on the right in that diagram, and how they present, so the fever patterns and the treatments and prophylaxis for each type. Then we have babesia, which is from the Ixides deer tick. It's actually the same tick, which is the vector for Lyme disease, which we spoke about earlier. It causes fever and hemolytic anemia in the northeastern United States. And on blood smear, you can see a Maltese cross. Then we have Trichomonas vaginalis, which is actually an STD. And that's going to cause foul-smelling green discharge, a strawberry appearance to the cervix. And for this, an important note is that you give metronidazole as the treatment to the patient, but also the partner as prophylaxis. So thank you for listening in. I hope this was helpful. And just so you guys know, this is the main stuff you have to know for the exam. But I definitely would go back into first aid or whichever resource that you're using to study for the exam and make sure you have all these details down cold and I can guarantee you will do very well on the exam. Thank you all.